It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, this government is fast-tracking its luxury spa bill, Bill 154. Uh, last week, the opposition tried to find out why exactly the government is trying to preemptively block people from suing them for misrepresentation or misconduct when it comes to the Ontario Place scheme. We didn't get much of an answer uh, from the minister, so I'm hoping the Premier can shed some light on this. Why does his government need the power to commit acts of misfeasance, bad faith, breach of trust, and breach of fiduciary obligation while building this luxury spa at Ontario Place? And to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much to the member for the question, Mr. Speaker. We've had a successful number of weeks in this House, Mr. Speaker. We landed a historic deal with the City of Toronto to provide more supports for the TTC, be it in operations or safety. Mr. Speaker, we, re we uh, released the business case, which clearly defined everything that government has been saying for the last year and a half about the fact that it will save $600 million of taxpayer money, money to move the Science Centre to Ontario Place. And now, Mr. Speaker, we're presenting legislation so that we can get on with it and start con construction at Ontario Place so that we can bring it back to life and make it a place that families can enjoy once again. The supplementary question. Creative math there, Speaker. Uh, and of course, don't, let's not forget the government is planning to spend at least $650 million of taxpayers' money to subsidize this uh, luxury spa. And, Speaker, Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights gives the public the right to be consulted and heard on matters that affect our environment, matters that would include exemptions to the Environmental Assessment Act that are being included in the Luxury Spa Act Bill 154. But in an extraordinary step, Speaker, the government won't even send Bill 154 to committee for public hearings. Wow. Why is the Premier so afraid to hear what the public has to say about this bill? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, as I've explained many times in this House before, we have issued two environmental assessment and environmental assessment for the site servicing work that is underway today, and of course an environmental class C assessment for the public realm space, the 50 acres of public realm space that will exist at Ontario Place. As we submitted our development application to the City of Toronto, we also submitted 40 different studies, 40 different studies that cover everything from air to wind to soil to stormwater, conservation plan, heritage impact assessment. Mr. Speaker, government believes that we have done our due diligence and now it's time to move on and bring Ontario Place and the Science Centre back to life. The final supplementary. First of all, Speaker, the Minister knows perfectly well that the environmental assessment is not being done on the West Island where this luxury spa is happening. <laughs> Speaker, this government's Luxury Spa Act, Bill 154, is another attack on democracy and basic norms of lawfulness and good governance. It specifically blocks people from suing the government for misrepresentation or misconduct, Speaker. It specifically blocks remedies for people who have been harmed by this government. What's more, it gives a new minister the power to issue, issue ministerial zoning orders, which this government has already, as we know, widely abused. With this government currently under active police investigation by the RCMP speaker, why is the Premier fast-tracking a bill to give his government the power to ignore the law? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, what this bill helps us do is bring Ontario Place back to life. Make it a place that families can enjoy 365 days of the year which will include a brand new amphitheater that will run all year long, a wellness, a water park facility, and a brand new science centre that will serve constituents and residents for the next 50 years. What this bill also does, Mr. Speaker, is provide operational dollars to the TTC for the new transit lines that we are building. It also provides money for new trains. It also provides money so that people can be safe on the TTC when travelling to work. Mr. Speaker, we landed a historic deal, 
and we're also making extreme progress out of Ontario Place so that we can once again enjoy the site after years of neglect. Wow. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Um, we have just two weeks left, at most, I think, in this legislature uh, this year, and people are counting on us to deliver for them, all of us. Instead of using their majority to bring some relief to people, this government has spent this session reversing legislation that they had just passed and giving themselves sweeping new powers for pet projects like the Ontario Place Luxury Spa. Speaker, when the NDP brought forward positive solutions like paid sick days and free contraception, the government seemed to signal some support for those things. When push came to shove, though, Speaker, they said no. Speaker, to the Premier, don't Ontarians deserve better than a government mired in scandal and focused solely on their insiders? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I'd love, it to, I'd love an opportunity to, to talk about some of the things that this government is doing to provide relief for families. Number one, the historic deal that we uh, managed to accomplish with the City of Toronto, keeping people safe on the TTC. That is a huge priority in the City of Toronto. Order. Certainly brings relief to my cons hardworking constituents in Etobicoke. What about fare and service integration? to make it easier for transit riders to cross boundaries, saving them $1,600 a year? What about building more transit stations in the greater Toronto area? I would say we have had quite the productive session this fall session, and we look forward to continuing on in the next two weeks. Supplementary. Speaker, while this government is mired in this scandal and under criminal investigation by the RCMP, after five years of Conservative government, life is harder for Ontarians. The cost of everything, whether it's housing or groceries or transit, transit speaker, are out of control. When given the chance to do something about it, the Premier said no. The NDP put forward a proposal to close the loopholes that let unscrupulous landlords gouge tenants. The government said no. We tabled a motion to invest in desperately needed non-market and affordable housing options. The government said no. To the Premier, why Order. does he keep saying no to solutions that would actually help people keep a roof over their heads? Members will take their seats. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Government House. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. First, uh, let me just uh, congratulate the leader of the Green Party and the new uh, member of provincial parliament uh, here, Mr. Kitchener. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, of course, never easy turning a seat that has been uh, historically liberal and NDP, uh, but uh, you were able to accomplish that, so I congratulate, uh, I congratulate the both of you for doing that. I would suggest. Uh, I would also suggest to the Leader of the Opposition that uh, she might want to take a look at the results of, uh, of the by-election, and yet another safe NDP seat has been lost, Mr. Speaker. And you know why that is? Because the Leader of the Opposition Order. isn't focusing on the things Order. that matter to the people of the province of Ontario. When we reduce costs for people, the Leader of the Opposition votes against it, Mr. Speaker. When we put more money back in the pockets of the people of the province of Ontario, they vote against it. The Liberals have just order. nominated elected a leader who spends Member more time Ottawa in the South Hamptons on order. private jets than the Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Speaker. Response. When it comes to listening to the province of Ontario, there is one party that does it, and it's the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Final supplementary. Well, you know, there, there you go, Speaker. There you go. This is a government that doesn't care. The Leader of the Opposition has the floor. She's the right to ask a question. I need to be able to hear it. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition for the interruption. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, there you go again, right? The, the, glad to see the Premier finally join us this morning. <laughs> I didn't point out when he wasn't here.
here. The clock's ticking. Um, I think it appears it's, it's necessary for the speaker to once again remind the members for the 999th time that it's totally inappropriate to make reference to the absence of another member. Because from time to time, all of us might be absent for good reasons. So let's see if we can reach a little higher on that one. Leader of the Opposition. Um, well, well, Speaker, we... <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Mother... Uh, speaker, I, I gotta say, um, you know, once again, we see this government. You know, their priorities are just not consistent with the burden that so many people in this province are carrying right now. Uh, let's take the rising cost of energy, shall we, Speaker? New Order. Democrats proposed a smart solution Order. to help people reduce the cost of heating. Minister and of Education, come to order. At the same time. The Conservatives said no. Their solution? Write a letter to Ottawa and hope someone Mr. else Connor does Stoga, something. Come to order. Yeah. You've been in power for five long years. People are struggling. Question. There's real issues that people deserve answers to. Speaker, as we head into the holidays, when will this government start saying no to their insiders and start saying yes to regular Ontario? Members will take their seats. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, this, of course, this is an NDP leader who has to battle with her own executive council to retain her job as the leader, who ran unopposed and has just lost a by-election in one of the safest sure. NDP seats in the province of Ontario. And she says we're not connected with people, Mr. Speaker. We have put 700,000 people to work who didn't have the dignity of a job before, Mr. Speaker. This is a leader who could call Jagme Singh right now and say, bring down the Liberal government Order. in Ottawa if you don't take away the carbon tax. Will she do it? I doubt it, Mr. Speaker, because for the NDP, it's about increasing taxes, it's more red tape, regulation. That's what they do best. The people of the province of Ontario have turned their backs on that, like her party has turned their backs on her, and like the people in Kitchener did just on Response. Thursday, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question. The member for order. Stop the clock. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The member for Mississauga Malton will come to order. It's usually you. Start the clock. I apologize. Member for Ottawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Phil Verster, the million dollar CEO of Metrolinx, missed yet another deadline last week with the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. In September, Mr. Verster told us we needed to give him some space. And he'd get back to us with an update in two months on this failing project. What was that update, Speaker? That we would find out 60 days before the Eglinton Crosstown might open. Thank a simple question, Premier. Were you satisfied with that answer? Thank you. Thank you. Members will make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. The Minister of Transportation can reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have launched one of the largest investments into public infrastructure and transit in the history of North America, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that member and the, uh, the leader of the official opposition has voted against every single one of those measures, including the Kitchener line, Mr. Speaker. The, the NDP has just lost one of their safest seats in Kitchener, Mr. Speaker, and that's because they have voted against the Kitchener line and the upgrades and the investments that we have made into the Kitchener line every step of the way. Mr. For Waterloo, come to order. It's about time that the NDP support public transit and the investments that we are making, $70 billion, whether it's the Crosstown, whether it's the Ontario Order. Line, whether it's all the way to a go, Mr. Speaker, it's time for the NDP to shift focus and support this government as we build public Response. transit across this province. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. No, colleagues, you have to answer 
why aren't we getting an answer to this question that we keep yes. raising? Why is it that Mr. Verster can earn a million dollars, preside dollars. over a project which is three years late, a billion dollars over budget, and just told us that we might get an update 60 days before it opens? Why aren't we getting an answer? Why are we hearing a government? talk about its aspirational plans. While somewhere in this province someone is waiting for the rain for a bus that is late because this government in cities outside Toronto is not funding public transit. Why does Mr. Verser still have his job? Right. Why does he still have 78 executives serving him, wow. soaking up the sunshine list? Answer the question this morning. Lean into the microphone. Right. Are you happy with the answer Mr. Verser gave us? Or are you going to fire him like a competent government would? There you are. Please take reply, the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the carbon tax king that wants the highest <laughs> carbon tax in the entire world yeah, to gouge the Order. people, gouge the people in a ride. But I, I, I. The Premier will take a seat. Now, <laughs> the Premier has the floor. He has the right to answer the question. I, I need to be able to hear him. Yeah. Premier. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I could have sworn he said we aren't funding transit. $70 billion is not funding transit. The largest transportation project, largest subway project in North America, spending $28 billion, making sure that we have the Edlington West Line, that's a head of uh, schedule on time, on budget. We're going full steam on Opposition the Young North, Mr. Speaker. Response. And Scarborough, the folks of Scarborough are finally getting a subway yeah. that they've been waiting for decades. And of course, Thank you. Thank you. Order. The opposition will come to order. The next question. Brought to you by Grimm's Fairy Tales. <laughs> I didn't hear who said that. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, the carbon tax is essentially a tax on everything, and the residents of northern, remote, and Indigenous communities feel the effects of this tax most severely. For more than a year, the Chiefs of Ontario have been calling on the federal government to consult with them on the effects of this harmful and regressive tax on their communities. Sadly, the federal government has failed to consult with Indigenous communities and properly address their concerns. The Chiefs of Ontario have recently filed for a judicial review into the application of the carbon tax in Indigenous communities in Ontario, calling this tax both anti-reconciliatory and discriminatory. Speaker, can the minister please comment on the judicial review process of the federal carbon tax for Indigenous communities in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, in an effort to take the grin off of the Leader of the Opposition's face on this question, it's actually shifted to a very serious tone. We saw a federal government uh, choose, handpick a region of Canada for relief from the carbon tax. For weeks we've been talking about how the hardship of this tax is on all Ontarians, but particularly vulnerable populations in regions of Ontario. Premiers across the country have chimed in with policy solutions to address this tax. Now, Mr. Speaker, that debate is moving into a courtroom. Last Thursday, the Chiefs of Ontario said in their statement that Canada has refused to enter into good faith conversations to, resu to resolve the harms caused by the carbon charge. The federal government, of course, responded by saying, we are pledging 0.7 percent relief from the carbon charge to Indigenous populations in Canada. Mr. Speaker, that is a mere pittance. The people of Ontario, including our Indigenous communities, deserve relief from this. Bons. The Prime Minister must now scrap the tax before the court does. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It is difficult to witness the federal government place this punitive tax on the North. 
The carbon tax negatively impacts affordability and increases the cost of living in northern and indigenous communities. It is sad and unfortunate that the federal government is ignoring these critical concerns. First Nations communities across Ontario are having to endure higher operating costs, higher fuel bills, higher heating bills, and out-of-control food prices. That is why it is so disappointing to see how the opposition consistently downplays the crippling economic impact that the carbon tax is having. The reality is, is that Canada's carbon pricing regime disproportionately impacts First Nations communities. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting First Nations in responding to the negative impacts of the carbon tax? Thank you. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Last week, Mr. Speaker, uh, we saw an extraordinary action taken by the Chiefs of Ontario, and it's one that we strongly support. And I hope that the member from Kiwaitnam will stand in solidarity with the Indigenous uh, leadership from across the province, in fact, who have filed this injunction. Grand Chief Abram Benedict of Akwesasne said on Thursday that Canada should be working with us to confront the climate and crisis and close gaps on reserve instead of creating policies in an ivory tower that exacerbates the affordability issues our citizens face. It's an incredibly insightful comment, Mr. Speaker. We know that our government has worked to reduce the, the cost of fuel for planes flying into the north, for people operating vehicles across the province, Mr. Speaker, building electrification projects Taunt. to a scale never seen before. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we just hope that the federal government will finally get the message and scrap this tax before the court. Thank you. The next question. The member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. <laughs> Speaker, since this government came to office, the post-secondary sector has seen a 12 per cent decline in operating grants. Per-student funding now accounts for less than one-third of university operating revenues, by far the lowest in Canada. While the need for investment in student mental health, housing and other supports has never been greater. Last week, the Council of Ontario University Universities released a report on the extensive efforts already being made by the sector to find efficiencies and cost savings. Speaker, how can this government possibly think that the funding crisis they created can be magically solved by universities just finding more efficiencies? Yeah. To respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. We are taking our time in reviewing the 31 recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Panel's report. We're working very closely with Colleges Ontario and the Council of Universities of Ontario as well. We're putting working groups together to work directly with my ministry on those recommendations. But we launched the Blue Ribbon Panel because we wanted independent and expert-driven advice to help form a practical and principled way forward for the sector. I'll tell you, if we wanted to waste tax dollars, we would have called it the orange or the red panel. But, Speaker, while the Liberals and NDP blew their chance to prioritize students when they held the balance of power, Order. our government will always put the needs and future of students first. Speaker, unlike our Blue Ribbon panel that focused on a shared approach to supporting post-secondary education in Ontario, the Liberals and NDP previously partnered in blowing Response. through spending blowing off the needs of students and blowing off their responsibility to the taxpayers of this mm -hmm. province. That is why our government struck a blue ribbon panel to ensure that the student experience and access to education is enhanced. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, the Council of Ontario Universities warns that changes to tuition in 2019, coupled with the reduced operating grants and rising inflation, have created a perfect storm for the sector. Eight universities are reporting deficits, including Queen's and the University of Waterloo. More universities may face insolvency. At the same time, Speaker, Ontario University tuition fees remain among the highest in Canada. Students should not have to make up for this government's failure to properly fund universities, especially during an affordability crisis. Will this government commit today to a sustainability plan for the sector that increases operating grants without increasing student tuition? Minister of Colleges and Universities. 
Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, do I need to remind the, the, the member, as well as the, the Liberal caucus, as well, that they voted against tuition decreases in 2019? Yes. My ministry has already begun working with institutions 10%. on a financial accountability framework that will allow for early detection of financial challenges and require immediate action to correct bad practices. In order for our sector to be sustainable for the long term, institutions need to take leadership and review their operations from top to bottom, from governance practices, program offerings, day-to-day -day operations, everything in between. Colleges and universities across the province need to become the best possible version of themselves. Mm -hmm. This is not a change that will happen overnight, but it is one that is necessary so that students, families and, of course, the taxpayers can have confidence that every dollar that is being allocated appropriately Response. and with complete transparency. Thank you. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Our government must ensure that Ontario seniors receive the quality care that they need. By building 30,000 long-term care beds and upgrading 28,000 beds, seniors in the communities across the province will receive the care that is close to their home. Speaker, seniors and families in Richmond Hill are relieved. However, our government must continue to make an investment that will expand programs and provide the specialized services to our seniors. That said, in order to implement special services and increase the number of direct care hours per day, there must be sufficient staff. Speaker, can the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to deliver high quality care to residents in long-term care homes? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. That member's question is very well timed, because last week on November 23rd, alongside General Jones, we announced $300 million in provincial funding to help recruit thousands of PSWs in the long-term care community. <laughs> Speaker, that's $25,400 in incentives to PSW students and recent graduates. Here's how it breaks down, Speaker. $10,000 to those who commit to working in a long-term care home and community care for at least 12 months. Another $10,000 to help with relocation costs for those who commit to working in rural, remote, or northern communities for 12 months, plus a $5,400 allowance to students while they complete their clinical placement in a long-term care home or community care. Speaker, by recruiting thousands of new PSWs into the sector, we are ensuring that people who need care in the long-term care setting have the best care available to them, working towards that four hours of daily care per month. Speaker, we're getting it done for seniors in our sector. The supplementary question. That is great. It is great to hear about our government's investment to recruit more PSWs. We know that PSWs are essential in providing care to our seniors living in long-term care each and every day. However, it takes an entire team to care providers to ensure that our residents receive the care and services that they need. This includes nurses who are vital in order to meet the growing needs of Ontario's seniors. By recruiting and investing in additional staff, our government is ensuring that our seniors receive the high quality of care they deserve. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting long-term care homes to deliver safe Question. and effective care? Minister of Long-Term Care. You know what, Speaker? Beds are furniture. We're building homes for our great seniors in this province. And that means it takes more than just the 58,000 spaces we're creating. It takes more than the $4.9 billion we're investing into health human resources. We need to give hope to these workers who do the work for our loved ones that many of us cannot do, Speaker. That's why we are investing in recruiting more PSWs. We are also providing $100 million to help PSWs who want to become practical nurses and advance their careers, uh, and practical nurses who want to become registered nurses to do the same, an opportunity to scale up and to continue to prosper and succeed while they help our seniors, Speaker. Our efforts 
are leading to results. 2,000 new nurses to the long-term care sector will be added by 2025, which will ultimately help reach our goal, as the member said, of four hours of daily care per resident. Let's remember, Speaker, seniors built our lives as we know it. They built our communities. They took care of us. We have a moral imperative to take care of them. That's exactly what this government is doing by investing in them, Speaker. We're getting it done for seniors. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the government presented a so-called business case to justify its decision to build a half-sized Ontario Science Centre on top of a public-funded parking garage uh, the Premier wants to build for a luxury spa company. The business case actually showed that the cost of building a new science centre at half the size is twice the cost of repairing the existing heritage building. Not only that, according to the province's lease speaker with the City of Toronto, the province is already required to make these repairs regardless of what happens to the Science Centre. So my question is to the Premier, and hopefully he answers today. Why does the business case misleadingly present the choice as relocation? I, I heard the comment. Thank you very much for drawing it to my attention. The member must, must withdraw her unparliamentary comment. Thank you. So withdraw. And, continue. and conclude her question. Order. And conclude her question. My question to the Premier. So why does the business case interestingly present the choice as relocate versus repair when the province is already required to make these repairs no matter what? To respond, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where to start. It was the NDP that's been crying for months to make the business case public, and we have. And do you know what the business case says? That, two, that taxpayers will be saving $257 million over a 50 year span in today's dollars, but $600 million over 50 years if you take into account inflation. We are building a brand new science centre, one that will be modern, one with new exhibits, new technology, and one that will have 10,000 square feet more of exhibition space for the children to enjoy. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The only way the province can legally avoid its responsibility for repairing the Ontario Science Centre is by negotiating the decommissioning of the existing building with the City of Toronto. This is a heritage building, Speaker. Even if the City of Toronto was willing to negotiate its destruction, the minister responsible for the Ontario Order. Heritage Act would need to approve. Turns out, right after the last election, the Premier transferred this responsibility to his nephew, the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Whoa. Question back to the Premier. Did the Premier put his nephew in charge of the Ontario Heritage Act because he was already planning the destruction of the Ontario Science Centre? Members will take their seats. Order. 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 Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the results of the business case were very clear. The Science Centre is 54 years old. It is end of life. The business case. Order. Order. The business case was done by third party experts in the field. In the business case, it said we had to start Opposition come to order. future options. Now, I know what the NDP would like to do. They would like to just leave the building and let it continue to fall apart until they are forced to close it. What we would order. like to do. Order. What we would like to do, Mr. Speaker, is be responsible and provide a long-term solution. We want a science centre for the Spons. next 50 to 100, 100 years, and we will have one at Ontario Place. Next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations to our new leader, Bonnie Crombie. I'll start with that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The people of Ontario are sick of deceit. 
They deserve transparency. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary command. Withdraw. Serve a trustworthy government that sticks up for them instead of wealthy insiders. Might I mention the RCMP criminal investigation into the $8.3 billion Greenbelt land swap again? Speaker, Order. Ontarians need to know why Metrolink Order. continues to delay, delay, delay. It's been over 12 years of construction on the Ellington LRT. Where are the answers? There's no timeline for its opening, and Metrolink announced last week that there will be no more. announcement with just three months question. of Kenya. When will the, uh, my question to the speaker, when will he step up and demand accountability from his friend, Metrolink CEO Phil Verster, and finally get an opening date for the Eglinton LRT and broadcast it to the public? Order. <laughs> Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, that uh, former Liberal government was responsible for signing that horrible contract, Mr. Speaker. They were the reason this project is so delayed. Well, we're going to deliver it, Mr. Speaker, just like we're delivering our $70 billion transit plan. When the Liberals had a chance for 15 years to build transit in this province, they did absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. They ignored the people of Scarborough, but this Premier, under his leadership, is building the Scarborough subway extension, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of this Premier, we're building the Ontario line. The former Liberal government ignored the concerns and the, uh, and, and the support uh, that transit needed in this province. The Ontario line will take 28,000 cars off the road. The Liberals have voted against $70 billion in public transit uh, investment in this province every single time that they've had a chance, whether Spons? it's been in their budget, whether it's been in the Fez, Mr. Speaker. They did absolutely nothing for this province. Thank you to the Premier of this province, who is building public transit across the country. And the order is supplementary question. Speaker, as a public en sector entity, Metrolinx has an obligation to be transparent, fair and honest with Ontarians. Instead, they hide valuable information from all of us. Even their organizational structure is a mystery. Why does an agency of the Government of Ontario get to conceal who their highest earning employees are and how many executive level staff they employ? My team and I have searched their website and asked our Metrolinx contacts for this information, but apparently it's not available to be shared publicly. What? Pardon me? A public sector agency not sharing their information publicly? Who can get away with this kind of conduct? It's unacceptable. Speaker, to the Premier, will you commit Order. to requiring Metrolinx to post an entire organizational chart Question. publicly and show the people of Ontario that you actually care about transparency and accountability. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we took our plan to build Ontario to the people of this province on December 2nd, and we received a resounding response to that plan to build. One, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberals did absolutely nothing to support or have done absolutely nothing to support transit in this province. Let's take a, a look at the projects that we're doing across Ontario, the Ontario Line. The Scarborough subway extension, the Young North subway extension, which we just announced a huge milestone on just this past Friday, the Eglinton uh, West Crosstown extension and the Eglinton West project, the Finch West LRT, Mr. Speaker, the Hazel Milcallion line, the Hamilton LRT, Mr. Speaker, and then let's talk about our highways, Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass. We are building this province, Mr. Speaker, and the Liberals. When they had a chance to do anything to support public transit, to support highways, they did absolutely response. nothing, Mr. Speaker. They, they did absolutely the nothing for the people of this province. Order. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are changing the face of transportation in this province, building highways and building subways. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Housing. When the previous Liberal governments took office and in 2003, Ontario was registering 85,000 home starts per year, and after 2004, Ontario never hit 80,000 housing starts until the Liberals were removed from office. The NDP record was even worse. In fact, based on their policies, it would take 50 years to build 1.5 million homes. The housing crisis that we've inherited was a result of the failures of previous Liberal governments government supported by the NDP to plan ahead for the future needs of Ontario. 
In contrast, our government must be focused on helping Ontarians find homes that meet their needs and budget. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is Question. increasing housing supplies? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the well-researched question from the member from Thornhill. You know, Speaker, last week on November, on November 27th, Ontario held its first ever housing forum at Exhibition Place. It was a great event. We had home builders there, modular home builders there. The great not-for-profit sector was represented. Municipalities, councillors, mayors and wardens were there, uh, planners, and obviously uh, all industry stakeholders. It was a great event where everyone shared their exper expertise and experience. And what happened? We had great cross-pollination of ideas. Ideas and solutions came forward. And these solutions, Speaker, are going to be incorporated into our next Housing Supply Action Plan, by the way, which is working because we've seen record housing starts in the last three years, record rental starts in the last three years. The plan is working. We know there's headwinds. We're going to work hard to challenge those that might even be inflation and maybe the carbon tax, maybe, maybe not. Um, at the end, Speaker, we're building Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response, and thank you for his hard work for the people of Ontario. When the Associate Minister was appointed, the Premier identified the importance on focusing on solutions to increase the supply of affordable housing. Speaker, individuals and families across Ontario deserve an opportunity to find a home that meets their needs. This includes modular homes that could increase the speed of home construction on Ontario, helping to make home ownership attainable for more people. Innovative construction techniques like this could allow Ontario to use manufacturing skills to build factory made homes more efficiently. So, Speaker, can the Associate Minister please update the Legislature on what progress has been made on modular housing con uh, constructions? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. In fact, last week, um, uh, as the member will learn here, uh, one of the four breakout sessions was totally dedicated towards the modular building sector for the province. Um, the modular home framework is being developed. Again, part of our housing action supply. Um, we're working with our municipal partners. In fact, Speaker, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was joined with a great member from Scarborough Centre, along with the Mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, and we visited 39 Dundalk uh, Drive in Scarborough, where they put up 57 supportive housing units, all modular. And I would point out that modular construction was built here in Ontario, built in Cambridge, Ontario, an Ontario-made solution that will continue to su succeed. <laughs> Scale and speed is what this is about, Speaker. Modular is another tool in the toolbox. It will support our Response. housing supply action plan, our homelessness prevention plan. Everyone deserves a roof over their head. The job is getting done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. We have an affordability crisis in the province of Ontario, and people in my community in Niagara are suffering. We have a historic increase in the use of food banks. In Niagara Falls, Project Share food banks serve more than 11,000 people. That's one in every eight residents. Think about that. And it represents a 71 percent increase from the year before. Despite these challenges, the Premier thinks we should be spending $650 million of hard-earned tax dollars on a private spa. Speaker, is. when is the Premier going to take real action to address the affordability crisis? Thank you. Ms. Bond, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my uh, honourable colleague for their question. Mr. Speaker, affordability for the people of Ontario has been our primary focus from the day we got elected, Mr. Right. Speaker. Just recently, I joined the Minister of Education, the wonderful Minister of Education, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, in increasing the street nutrition program in the province of Ontario by $5 million to help families. Mr. Speaker, we have either reduced or eliminated the lift tax credit, which helps the lowest income earners in our province, Mr. Speaker. The child care tax credit, Mr. Speaker. The Resilient Communities Fund, which Order. provides $96 million of funding to nonprofits in, in, our, in our communities, including 
to food banks, Mr. Speaker, as well as increasing the minimum wage. Mr. Speaker, we have reduced gas tax for the people of Ontario. We have removed tolls and removed license plate stickers. The only one Response. problem here is, Mr. Speaker, do you know the one thing that we have in common here? We've done all this to reduce costs for the people of Ontario. NDP has voted systematically against every single effort. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Minister, 25 per cent of children in the province of Ontario are using food banks. Very shameful. Right across the province of Ontario and in Niagara, people are dying on the streets. They are. This government can continue to point fingers and list their, their superficial affordable accomplishments, but it doesn't change the fact that real people are suffering. The Feed Ontario report was clear, Mr. Speaker. The driver of food bank futures was precarious employment, yes, yes, legislated poverty, yep. and housing, and the high cost of living. The Premier has refused to raise social assistance rates, That's right. and he wasted, wasted a year on his Greenbelt scandal instead of building the houses we need. Yep. Speaker, when is the Premier going to stop the handouts to developers, private interests, and instead deliver for Ontarians and stop the dying on the streets in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Much for the follow-up question. Mr. Speaker, I will remind my colleague and everybody in the House here that it was this government that provided over $1.2 billion of social assistance, social services relief fund to our communities across the province, Mr. Speaker. The member referenced social assistance. We increased ODSB rates highest in the history of the, of the program by 5 percent, indexed it to inflation, which as a result is now nearly 12 percent in less than one year. Mr. Speaker, when it when it comes to cost of living, I will remind my honourable colleague and everybody across there, Mr. Speaker, Order. we have said from the beginning that there is one thing that is rising the cost of everything in this province. The, the government house leader has been so gracious in even providing phone numbers to the opposition to call their colleagues in Ottawa to stop the carbon tax, which is adding the cost to everything in this province, and it's hurting our most vulnerable, Mr. Speaker. It's time for them to stand up for Ontarians, help us, join, allow, tell the federal government. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Oh, great Ontario has a robust agriculture and food industry that contributes over $48 billion to wow. our province's GDP and economy. And it represents more than 800,000 jobs. And I'd like to point out, Mr. Speaker, that is about one in 10 of our jobs are in agriculture. But I guarantee you that 10 out of every 10 consume what comes from agriculture. Here, here. That's why it's so vital that this sector continues to grow and produce more food for Ontario's growing population and expanding export market. The agriculture and food industries must continue adopting new processes and implementing new equipment and technologies to expand production and enhance efficiency. That's why our government must do all that we can do to strengthen our province's vital agriculture and agri-food sector. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the growth of Ontario's agriculture and food sector? Here, here. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the question coming from the member for Peterborough, because he actually has an innovation cluster in his riding in the city of Peterborough that really is all-encompassing, including food production. I very much appreciated the opportunity to visit that with him recently. And I want to touch on the fact that we are not resting on our laurels, Speaker. We're continuing to invest so that farmers and processors alike understand that they finally have a government in Ontario that is working with them to continue to increase production. We're investing $25 million in partnership with the, the Feds through the Sustainable Cap Program, but the total results are going to be driven by Ontario farmers and processors through the Agritech Innovation <coughs> Initiative. And this is going to just re reap incredible returns. And I think Response. we need to recognize that all of our sectors are increasing production, and now we need the food processing to continue to innovate and match what the farmers are doing on the land. Thank you very much. 
Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And from the minister's response, it's clear that adopting new innovations and technology processes is crucial to ensuring the continuous growth of our agriculture and food sectors. And she's absolutely correct. The innovation cluster in Peterborough does a fantastic job of promoting it. But beyond that, I'm going to take a second and say Trent University has an experimental farm that is absolutely fantastic, and I invite everyone to come down and see it. At a time when food security is paramount, meeting the goals of the Grow Ontario strategy remain a top priority. All Ontarians deserve consistent and reliable access to affordable and nutritious food. And that's why our government must continue to make investments that will support our farmers and food producers to enhance food production. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the Agritech Innovation Initiative will help to strengthen Ontario's agriculture and food sector? Mr. of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Very much, and I, I think it's safe to say that we appreciate very much that farmers are early adopters of new technologies and best practices to drive production numbers, and our processors stand beside them in that regard. And you know, I read recently that researchers for, are forecasting an increase of 12 billion USD to be invested in information technology, robotics, and sensors that are going to continue to drive innovation. And it's important that our legislation here provincially in Ontario matches what is happening on the ground. And so that is why it's very important that in tandem, of, in, in tandem to investing in significant processes that lead to innovation, we need to make sure we catch up our legislation as well. And that's why I was very pleased to present Bill 155 last week Bonds. so we can amend the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario Act and make sure it's modernized and supporting farmers and processors alike so we continue to stay on the fro forefront. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, there were at least two overdoses at the corner of Church and Wellesley in broad daylight, just three city blocks from this very building. Speaker, the community members were horrified to learn that getting someone into an, into an addiction treatment recovery bed takes at least a year. When we all know that mental health and addiction services are provincially funded, this government has been making one-off announcements for one-time funding, and it's clearly not meeting the basic needs. Can the Premier explain to this community and to those across the city why someone struggling with addictions is supposed to get help when there's no shelter and the wait list for basic recovery beds are at least one year long? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. As the member opposite knows, this government, the first government to make such substantial investments in mental health and addiction supports in the, in the history of this province, is making a difference by building a continuum of care in the communities. And what does that mean? Just recently, in February of this year, we opened up 400 new treatment beds, 7,000 new treatment spots to support individuals both with respect to withdrawal management, to support individuals with addiction treatment, and of course the support of housing that's necessary in that continuum of care. Mr. Speaker, we are serious about the investments that are making to ensure that every Ontarian gets the support they need wherever they are in the province of Ontario. Question. Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Maybe the minister didn't hear my colleague. Two people died just last week, three blocks from this building. Whatever you are doing is not enough. Is not enough. Speaker, back to the Premier. People wait months for detox beds, wait again for withdrawal management, and then again for rehab. Unless, of course, they can pay tens of thousands of dollars to get into a private clinic. In that time, many relapse or die. The Windsor-Essex County Health Unit has shown that Windsor Safe Point CTS is safe and effective. Hundreds of visits from people in need of care, referrals to addiction treatment, mental health support, social services have occurred in addition to primary care, wound care and foot care on site. It will close at the end of this year due to the lack of government funding. The Conservatives haven't provided a Question. timeline of when the provincial review that was declared in August will be completed, and the longer it takes, the more people will die. Speaker, when will this government finally treat mental health and addictions as a public health crisis and properly fund wraparound supports that will actually save lives? 
Minister, Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that question. And again, if the member opposite was listening, our government is investing in a continuum of care and ensuring that we build a system of care for individuals wherever they are in the province of Ontario. With respect to the CTS site, the member opposite is, should be familiar at this point that it is under a review as a result of the incident that occurred in Leslieville. And that review is, under, is ongoing and it will determine it will determine the best course of conduct within the province of ontario public safety is a priority for this government and Order. to ensure that individuals are safe not just the individuals that are using the consumption and treatment sites but also the people that reside in the areas where they are located is a priority of this government and until that review is completed and we will await that review, the member opposite has the ability Response. to also determine and to also participate by contacting the individual at Unity Health through their email address and perhaps engaging with them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Small Business. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, businesses left our province in droves. In contrast, under the leadership of the Premier, our government has welcomed record levels of investment, job growth and businesses. It's both unfortunate and sad that the independent Liberals and opposition NDP continue to sit on the sidelines criticizing our businesses and voting no to measures that help make things better. That's true. Small businesses in my riding have been vocal about the negative impact that increasing taxes and expanding red tape will have on affordability for all Ontarians. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain the negative impacts of increasing taxes on our small businesses? To reply, the Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Burlington for her unwavering support of her amazing job creators. Speaker, I know that so many of our small business owners are trying their best to keep their businesses alive. They're working long hours, paying their bills and doing their part to create opportunities in their communities. Businesses simply can't pass the cost from the additional taxes and red, red tape onto their customers. Many in their community are already feeling the pinch on gas, on groceries, on heating and much more. The reality that the Liberals and the NDP refuse to acknowledge are the tough choices businesses are, are making due to higher costs, like having to scale back staff or reduce inventory. Speaker, higher taxes increase costs and negatively impact every single aspect of our economy, Response. from the main streets to the farmhouses. We're calling on Ottawa to give our entrepreneurs a fair shot at success. Thank you, Speaker. Question. Thank you, Speaker. As we heard in the Minister's response, high taxes, rising interest rates and ongoing international supply chain challenges negatively impact our province's economic growth. That's why our government must continue to advocate for the people of Ontario, particularly our small businesses, to provide them with the support they require. Speaker, entrepreneurs need opportunities, not obstacles, to drive innovation and growth. While the Ontario Liberals have doubled down on their claims that families and businesses are better off with less money in their pockets, we know that couldn't be further from the truth. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on the consequences that increasing taxes, high interest rates, and burdensome red tape will have on our small businesses? Associate Minister of Small Business. Question. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the member from Burlington for the question. Speaker, I've been talking to entrepreneurs and business associations across the province, and the consensus is clear. And it's not just our government that is speaking out. The Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses' latest research shows three in five small businesses have seen their overall energy costs increase over 10 percent in the last year. Sixty percent of small businesses cannot pass the increase in energy costs to consumers, leaving them to either reduce operations or reduce staff. Speaker, it gets even worse. The 2022 report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer showed that the carbon tax will 
reduce real GDP across Canada by 1.3 per cent by 2030, and could cost us a whopping 200,000 jobs nationally by 2030. Speaker, that is Response. what this opposition needs to start thinking about the people of this province, start making life more affordable, and join us in calling Ottawa to scrap the tax scrap now. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. For two years and four months, the spot has been waiting here about provincial funding for supervised, supervised consumption site. Last year, Sudbury averaged nine opioid overdose deaths a month. In less than a month, the spot will run out of municipal funding and their doors will close forever. More people will die in Sudbury. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier finally help to save lives in Northern Ontario and fund Sudbury's supervised consumption site? And to apply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you once again for that question. Mr. Speaker, we are presently in a review with respect to the consumption and treatment sites. We all know what happened in Leslieville. We all know that we need to ensure public safety. We have an independent individual that's reviewing the consumption and treatment sites to ensure that public safety, as well as the safety of people using the sites, is taken care of. And, Mr. Speaker, until that decision is made, the decision is on pause as to what Order. will occur. In addition, Mr. Speaker, there, if there are concerns, I've mentioned that there is the possibility of contacting the individual doing the review and providing them with your views with respect to the issues. But, Mr. Speaker, one thing that I have to say is that you know, the situation Response. we have when it comes to addictions and having a treatment continuing, this government is the one government that understands the need and is building the continuum of care to ensure that the needs of individuals are met wherever they are in the province. Supplementary question. But frankly, no one believes that. Nine people a month for two and a half years, no one believes this. Crosses for Change is a memorial in Sudbury for people who have died by overdose. Three years ago, there was one cross. Now there are nearly 250 of them. Last Thursday, there was a rally in support of supervised, Sudbury's supervised consumption site, and we marched to those crosses, Speaker, and people were asked to speak, but no one could find the words because they couldn't choke past the tears. Those aren't crosses, those are people. Their best friends, their work friends, their neighbors, their sons, daughters, their mothers and fathers. Speaker, how many more people will have to die, and how many more crosses will Sudbury have to rise before the Premier funds Sudbury's supervised consumption site? Associate Minister of Mental Health, members of please take your seat. Associate Minister of Mental Health and, Addiction, and Addictions can reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, the decision is on pause until a decision is made, and it is being looked at from the perspective of public safety and ensuring that the places are safe for individuals as well. You know, Mr. Speaker, I listened to the questions being raised by the opposite side, and I asked myself, why did we get to where we are in the province? You should look at your own record and the reckless nature of the record that you have when you were in government and supporting the Liberals in the past. Order. You cut the number of beds in the Order. province of Ontario by almost 10,000 beds. You cut the funding to mental the health spending. To order. There was never a commitment by anyone on that side to invest in mental health. This government has been increasing the investment to the tune of $525 million each and every year. The question period has come to a conclusion. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 148, an act to amend the Auditor General Act and Members' Integrity Act 1994. Call on the members. This is a five-minute bell.